<laughs> Hello, Khaled. How are you? Hey, how are you? How are you? I'm fine. This is Gershom Gornberg speaking from Jerusalem. I'm in my okay. uh, tiny study in my home in Jerusalem. And, wonderful, uh, wonderful. Um, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, okay, Gresham, it's, it's all good to see you. What time is it now in Jerusalem? It's like uh, 7.30, I think. Like, uh, it's uh, right? actually 6.30 in the evening in Jerusalem. We're seven hours 6 apart. 6.30 p.m., so you've like, almost done with your working day, I assume. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, like, uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm Khaled Dawood um, from New York. Uh, I'm Al Jazeera correspondent here, and actually we're doing this from... Um, our, our office, our small Jazeera office inside the UN building, and that's usually where I do my live shots. So you can see the background is New York City. Uh, when I'm doing the UN story, we have another background with the UN written on it. So that's basically how it works here. And how long have you been uh, have you been reporting for Al Jazeera from New York? Uh, it's been a little bit over a year now. I started October '06, so I just finished one year, yeah, like a while ago. But before that, I was for four years in Washington, D.C., uh, as correspondent with Egypt's uh, Haram newspaper. Uh, that's I see. how it basically came to America, you know, because, uh, uh, yeah, Al Haram has always had an office here in America, and they have one office in D.C. and one office in New York, so I came to the Washington, D.C. office for four years, and then I moved to New York. So, all in all, slightly over five years in the United States. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I live in Jerusalem. I'm a senior correspondent for the American Prospect magazine. Uh, I've mm -hmm. uh, written two books. The more recent one was a history of the origins of Israeli settlement in the occupied territories called the Accidental Empire, which came out last year. And uh, I've lived in Jerusalem now for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that you just got married, Khaled. Yes, actually, yes, yes, I got married on October 20th, so I think I'm getting close to a month now. I got, I just got married in Cairo, actually. Um, I'm originally Egyptian, and I picked up, uh, we were coincidentally, luckily, met a nice lady from Morocco here in New York, and then we went to Cairo where we did our wedding, we went to Sharm el Sheikh for a little bit of a honeymoon, everybody should go to Sharm el Sheikh, it's beautiful, guys. And uh, then I came back here and back to the job. So, but now I'm a married man. I like the previous uh, <laughs> two uh, interviews I did with Bob. Did you uh, did you do any uh, uh, diving at Sharm el Sheikh? I did some snorkeling. I'm too much of a coward to go on a diving thing. You know, I've never done it before. And uh, yeah, but even snorkeling is fascinating. You know, it's just uh, an experience on its own. But unfortunately, I lost my marriage ring the first time I did my snorkeling. And, uh, yeah, I told the divers there to look for it, but I just bought a replica, you know, uh, of it uh, so that my wife won't get angry at me. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the, the coral reefs in any case. Um, the sign yes, of coast is beautiful. Is beautiful. Yeah. Um, you would probably have tried it yourself, it seems. I mean, I assume you've gone to Sharm el Sheikh. It's very close. The last time I was in Sharm el Sheikh was actually many years ago, but I've been at um, other spots along the, uh, along the Sinai Red Sea coast between there and uh -huh. uh, all the way up to um, the Israeli border in Eilat at various times. Yeah. And it's really quite yeah, yeah, beautiful you go, there. You probably can go to Taba, Nueva, Tarabin, this kind of area. Uh, right. You can get, uh, I think, driving without a visa, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in, in the world besides our, our enjoyment of the Sinai coast. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you you mentioned in an email and, and Bob did as well that uh, that uh, your expectations of the Annapolis summit coming up between uh, Israel and uh, the Palestinians in the United States are, are very low, um, and I would agree with that. But I'm just interested in hearing why why you have low expectations of that of that summit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. Actually, coincidentally, I was just reading an article in the New York Times a few days ago. I think everybody's lowering expectations from this upcoming meeting. Uh, I think uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, people were calling it a peace conference, something a la Madrid 1991 or something like that. But then um, in that article in the New York Times, they were saying that U.S. officials are now trying to just call it a meeting. And they're like sort of a beginning for and uranium negotiations. And, uh, you know, actually, just basically by reading the realities on the ground and uh, looking uh, at previous similar experiences, uh, um, first of all, it's rather um, 
would be like difficult for a U.S. president, I assume, in his last year at the White Office to do a breakthrough in, 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 in a very difficult issues such as the Middle East peace process. We have the Clinton experience in this regard. And, of course, you add to that the realities which is making this current administration very busy, namely Iraq, Afghanistan, and recently Iran. Uh, so it's like uh, I don't think that this administration is in this position. I think maybe relatively considering all the topics and considering people's experiences, a little bit more time needed than that. I, I guess, Gosh, you all are aware of some of the arguments that maybe had Clinton started a little bit earlier with his final status proposals, the Palestinian Israelis could have worked out something. I remember myself as a reporter, I covered the Taba negotiations just mm. before uh, you know, the, the new government uh, took over of Mr. Sharon and the negotiations, uh, the negotiators that t at that time said that they were never closer to an agreement like they were at that time. But nevertheless, there wasn't enough time for U.S. administration to kind of to stay in office in order to carry on these the results of these negotiations and, uh, and I assume well, so also, that's one factor with this administration and and then of, as I mentioned you know the, all the other issues that are more than enough to keep this president busy just Iraq in office is is, uh, is, is alone is, is a problem big problem that's keeping this administration very busy all the time it, it also seems to me uh, <coughs> I, I mean I, I have to admit I'm, I'm rather surprised by the whole idea of this meeting because for the last six and a half years, it seemed like the American administration was not really seriously interested in, uh, frankly, in negotiations as a way of getting things done, certainly not in the Middle East. And uh, their efforts at the, the whole Israeli-Palestinian issue have always seemed like there is a declaration, there is a big deal, you know, we're talking peace now, and then they go away again. So, um, well, Gresham, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. But actually, you know, I, well, like you also mentioned in one of the emails, you want to speak about the conspiracy or oriented theory or attitude, maybe, which some people always try to, you know, stereotype the Arab part of, you know, our world with, uh, like, we always think conspiracy oriented. But to be honest with you, I mean, like, just using deduction, in, which I studied, like, in my logic courses in school, that unfortunately every time the U.S. administration wants to make some major move in the region, they kind of try to revive the Middle East Palestinian Israeli issue to kind of gain the support of so-called moderate Arab countries for another something that's coming later. I'm just referring that if you remember the 1991 Madrid Peace Conference, it came after most Arab countries took part in the war against uh, Iraq, Saddam, at that time to liberate Kuwait. And the price or the promise which the Arabs got from the first Bush administration was we're going to have the Madrid Peace Conference and launch the peace process. In 2002, when the President Bush here now was planning the, the war against Iraq, we came up with a roadmap and the declaration of a Palestinian state. And at that time also, you know, many analysts kind of viewed that you know, now he wants to gain the support of moderate Arab countries uh, for the war against Iraq. So he's offering this uh, fig leaf, you know, kind of uh, moving the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And now I'm, I'm personally even, by even reading all the reports that you have here available in the American press, I'm very worried that this administration might be kind of um, on the brink of doing something against Iran. I don't know exactly what, but um, I'm suspecting that in the maybe next six months or something, if we don't see some sort of a, a, a movement against Iran one way or the other, maybe possible. They talk now a lot. I was just attending a news conference by John Bolton again. John Bolton, the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, he was openly saying that we should not exclude the option of targeted military strikes. Of course, he uses targeted, you know, which is could be an introduction for maybe... 20, 30 days of constant bombing of Iran or whatever. But anyway, I'm just saying that I'm just a little bit worried and suspicious uh, that why is this thing moving now? And also, even if it moved and this administration was sincere, maybe President Bush is finally changing his mind. He wants to do something positive before leaving the office. You know, maybe, but maybe even if this is the case, I, I don't think there is a lot of time left so that we can finalize this issue. I just referred earlier to the Clinton years when they were so close. I think they were so close. I've always, since the Clinton days, since I was a reporter covering the Palestinian Israeli talks, I always felt these guys have done a lot of progress in talking about many issues. There's a lot of, maybe you would agree with me, a lot of work on paper agreements, and if it is, it's the will to implement those agreements. And I suspect that there is so much will on the Israeli side or on the EU to implement or to make a historic peace deal now, or on the American side to push so far at an election year, which is very difficult. 
it, it would seem I don't know what you me, think. <laughs> it, it would, well, first of all, I, I mean, you mentioned the, the, uh, the difference, be, or you mentioned 1991 and then the roadmap, and I think one thing that's really striking there is uh, even if the Madrid conference was um, only meant as a follow-up for the war against Iraq, the critical difference is that Bush Sr. paid the check, right? He actually course, held he the conference. The and the uh, and some sort of process began there, and and uh, even if it changed form in over the next couple of years, you can really see Madrid as a uh, as a prelude to the Oslo Agreement and the original breakthrough between Israel and the of Palestinian course. Liberation Organization. Of course, of course. Whereas of course. in two thousand two, also Clinton picked up. Clinton, uh, Clinton picked up on it later, and that's why it was like kind of we saw some movement. In 2002, or 2003 actually, when the, when the roadmap came out, it was this big declaration. The year before in 2002, Bush had made his, his uh, lovely Rose speech Garden. on, on, on uh, the, the Israeli-Palestinian situation. He called for a uh, two-state solution, which two sounded um, like a major Historic. step forward for an American administration. But the the diplomatic will has has never been there, and and I admit that when I look at the the situation now, I first of all really wonder whether uh, Secretary of State Rice has uh, has real backing, whether the administration is is unified behind this thing, uh, or whether it's really uh, you know whether it's really Condi Rice out there on her own. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, in, in the past, I believe it was uh, former Ambassador to Israel Martin Indyk who said to me that that when American intervention diplomatically has worked, it's either been when it's been the president himself who's been involved, as was the case with Carter, or Very when true. when the envoy really was perceived by everybody on this side of the uh, uh, of the world as having the president's full. Um, Wait Support. behind him, as was the case with uh, Kissinger and the shuttle diplomacy, and I, the way I I read it from Jerusalem, I I don't really have that sense that that uh, that W is behind this thing. It, it sort of sounds like like uh, the the impression one gets is that is that Condi is flying solo on this, and that's not enough to that's not <coughs> enough weight behind that's not enough horsepower behind the 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 uh, behind the operation to make it move. The, the other thing mm -hmm. that I, I confess makes me um, very doubtful is that uh, it seems to me that we're talking about two incredibly weak leaders on the Israeli and the Palestinian side. Uh, Omer, uh, within Israeli politics, has uh, within the Israeli public has very little support. He's perceived as being incredibly corrupt. The police are investigating him for practically everything he's ever done. Uh, he blew whatever yeah. mandate he had when he was elected uh, when he went to war in Lebanon last year. So, uh, so he's very weak. And uh, then we're looking at uh, at Abu Mazen on the Palestinian side, and and uh, and it's hard to see how much. You know, Abu Mazen has the has the title president, but how much does he actually control? Does he actually have any power? He he's lost Gaza. Uh, we've seen the latest manifestation of that yesterday with the confrontation between uh, uh, Hamas and Fatah in 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 in, uh, in Gaza. Gaza. Uh, and in the West Bank, one wonders whether he really has any control. If if an agreement mm -hmm. was signed mm -hmm. with him, would he be able to to implement that agreement? So uh, yes. Yes. You know, you've got a weak was, Secretary of State, a weak uh -huh. Israeli Prime Minister, and a weak Palestinian President. It, mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. so, it doesn't sound like uh, like the high rollers are going to be there at the table. Well, I, I think it's already been kind of announced one way or the other that it's, this is meeting is going to be on the Foreign Minister's level. But what I was trying to refer earlier, like, you know, even, you know of course, uh, the Bush Sr. did follow up on of the issue of the Madrid Peace Conference, but I was what I was, you know, trying to indicate or imply is that whenever the United States wanted uh, the support of um, the, a number of Arab countries mm. uh, over an issue, whether the liberation of Kuwait uh, in 1991 or in the case of the more recent Iraq War, 
you always sense it and read it even in the U.S. press, someone saying that some advisors believe that we have to move the Palestinian-Israeli peace track in order to convince the other to join us on either the 1991 war, either in the second war in 2003, or even in the war against terror. So there is this kind of line that's playing right now, too, but I was wondering whether the price this time would be Arab support for some sort of action against Iran of whatsoever kind. You know, that's what's worrying me. Um, uh, or what I was trying to imply, but whenever they want to do something in the region, the U.S. administration, they move the Palestinians really track one way or the other. But also on the other point, you know, of what I was concerning Mrs. Condi Rice, you know, I mean, or Dr. Rice, you know, I, well, it depends. Again, you know, if you trust the reports that we read here in the U.S. media, like she's the closest to the U.S. president, I even hear from Arab diplomats, Arab ministers, you know, even if they're not so happy with how things are, they do feel a sense of dedication on behalf of Dr. Rice, but, you know, that she's serious, that she, I mean, I even remember, I don't know if it was one of those books, you know, uh, concerning the Bush administration or an article, uh, you know, in one of the newspapers that one of the reasons that was told, you know, that time why Rice accepted the job, that she asked President Bush personally, uh, are you going to uh, move the Palestinian-Israeli peace process so we're going to see a Palestinian state? I'm just saying that, you know, these are, this could be a possible, but the problem is that is there enough time? Is this administration has enough, like, you know, time to devote a very difficult issue such as the Middle East Conference and then forget a little bit about Iraq, uh, forget about uh, the war in Afghanistan, nothing, none of these who, I mean, despite all the rhetoric that we hear here from the Bush administration, you know, uh, nothing is really going so positive. You know, this president well, has only so one maybe year left. And, uh, and uh, one year left, and I'm sure maybe if he can fix something in Iraq so that his legacy would be, wouldn't be so disastrous, Maybe that for the American people in the local level in election year, that would be more beneficial to him in all practical terms than moving the Israeli-Palestinian peace track. It could be that part of what's going on here, you know, I spoke of, of the reasons that Ulmer and, and Abbas are weak. It could be here that what we really have is, is three sides that want to rescue their reputation by moving forward. Even let's say that that's, that that's true, or let's, you know, say that there's ulterior motives of each but stage of the game. A question, can I you ask you a question here? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask you a question. You know, I'm almost 40 years old now, and I'm personally following this uh, story of the uh, Palestinian-Israeli directly peace issues, like, say, for the past 20 years. And I don't think, and I read a lot, I, I, when I did my MA in, in Britain, I insistently studied the history of Zionism, and I, I did, a, I think, as much as I can, homework on this topic. But <clears throat> never, I think, in Israel's history since 1948 has been an Israeli government where you can say that it's so strong that it even enjoys the support or of 60 or even 70 percent, you know, maybe 60 percent, but not like, you know, never the solid majority that gives the, 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 the Israeli leader, whoever his name or maybe her name case of Mrs. Mayer, you know, uh, that has this kind of support to take big historic decisions. I remember, or at least if you just think of the recent history under Mr. Uh, Itzhak uh, Shamir, there was a big deal about whether he could stay in office or not by taking part in the 1991 peace conference, and then we had different election. We had Mr. Rabin. Mr. Rabin was assassinated. Uh, and then later, you know, we had uh, the Barack government when uh, he's about to take some historic decisions. There is internal Israeli divisions, parties withdrawing, parties joining, let's have new elections. So what I'm trying to say is that I think it's you will never find, apparently, out of looking at Israeli politics, that sort of Israeli government that enjoys such a wide support that they can like do like Nelson Mandela, for example, in South Africa. But at the same time, I think it needs the United States role. It's, it's, it's not that, you know, the guarantees that the United States could give to Israel to go ahead with, you know, the peace agreement or the historic agreement that they want to achieve is very vital. And I think that's what's always been missing. And, you know, uh, and, and I'm sure you are aware as much as I am aware of all these you know, schools of thought, I hear it. I've been here for five years in Washington, that the time is not the right time to settle the Palestinian-Israeli peace process, that there is a lot of conditions that we need to meet first before we discuss this. You know, even before the fall of Saddam and uh, Iraq, they would say we have to deal with Iran, we have to deal with Iraq, we have to make sure all the Arab countries are, you know, there is an entire school, and of course, even more, one of the topics, the, the links that you related to me, the, the, the influential Israel lobby here, they always try, and the advisors, senior advisors within the administration, you would hear it from them directly. 
this is not the time to reach a historic agreement. Maybe we should wait more. Maybe you should wait more. And I guess also, and correct me if I'm wrong, part of the ruling establishment's way of thinking in Israel, that the longer we keep this thing unsolved, you can make gains on the ground, you can build more settlements, you can usurp more Palestinian land, and maybe in the future things will change, we can reach a better deal. So I, I think that's really where major part of the problem is, and not only related to Omer being weak now or Abbas being weak now, because well, I, from I my perspective that, as an Arab, it's the issue of the occupation that matters most, and Israel's readiness to end that occupation. I don't think that inside Israel so far there's been that majority, big majority, that you know, could say like the one in 1988 against the war, 1982 against the war in Lebanon that said, listen guys, you have to get out of Lebanon. But I don't think there is that majority yet in Israel, strong one that says, listen guys, we've had enough, let's have the two-state solution, which is possible to achieve, you know, with the Palestinians. I would, I would say, uh, I would make several responses to that. First of all, there is um, an immense effect of what's going on on the Arab side. If you I, I came to Israel uh, in September of 1977, and if you had uh, asked Israelis in September of 1977 if they would be willing to give up the entire Sinai uh, down to the last inch for a peace agreement with Egypt when it was theoretical, mm -hmm. uh, the polling figures, I'm sure, would have been strongly against it. The moment sure. that that deal was really on the table, that there was a real live... Uh, uh, Arab leader standing in the Knesset and saying no more war uh, and we're willing to make that deal, the public mood switched completely and uh, a, a Begin had strong public support for, uh, for making that deal. So, and even uh, Sharon was the one who kind of forced the settlers to get out of the Sinai. Exactly, you know, the which was the really the last, the last thing that anybody would have expected. But the, the public support for a peace deal with Egypt when it was a real possibility was, uh, was extremely strong. And in fact, I was, I was in Jerusalem the day that, that Sadat came to Jerusalem. And the mood, like in, the mood in Jerusalem uh, at that time was... Uh, was incredible. It was euphoric. I've never, sure. I've never seen anything like it before or after. So the public support, I think, has, has to do largely with the perception of whether or not the deal is being discussed theoretically or, um, or realistically. I would say that in terms of, uh, of, the, of the Israel, um, of, of, of groups like APAC in the United States, that when the Israeli government, when there's been a government here that's been interested in moving forward, it's really put APAC on the side. I mean, the most, the strongest example of that was Yitzhak Rabin uh, during his second term in, in uh, the early to mid-90s. Um, I think he was interest, much more interested in moving forward than, uh, than some of the lobbying groups in the United States. Sure. And sure. he simply did that. Uh, they became... Uh, they became bystanders to, to everything that, that was going on. Uh, so I wouldn't see either of those as, as, as uh, factors that are blocking a deal. Furthermore, in terms of the Israeli public opinion but I think, now, but, but I, think I would say that... But like, I, think, I think that you would admit that the case of Palestine is different a little bit from Egypt. You know, Palestine is the, the, the part of the land where the fight is all over. But so Egypt... In the Golan Heights in Syria, you know, and I assume more recently with the Gaza Strip, you know, it's not like the West Bank. And I mean, I, I know and you know about all these, uh, you know, trips that Mr. Sharon used to organize by his helicopter for many congressmen and U.S. presidents, including this President Bush, you know, over the West Bank to show them how this land is small. So I'm just saying maybe in the cases of Egypt, and I'm just mentioning particularly when it comes to Palestine, this historic area where, where the fight is really about, you know, I mean, at least maybe in the mind, the Arab minds that, you know, Egypt, uh, the, the part of Sinai, the part of the Gulen, were kind of collateral damage for the original, you know, kind of fight over Palestine itself. So that's maybe why. That's why I was referring. Well, you, you have know, to remember, at though, least, you, since the signing of Oslo agreements, you know, um, you know, Barack. I mean, Barack. He, I was very, I'm personally, I was kind of optimistic and overtaken. When he took office, I was really thought, wow, this is going to be the guy who follows Rabin's footsteps. And even 
you remember those days, Gresham, like even Assad, uh, the late Hafez Assad, for the first time, he said in 96, maybe 97, that uh, we have a strong leader of Israel in, uh, in now, right now in Tel Aviv or, you know, something like that. It was the first time that Syrian president would praise, you know, Barack saying he's a courageous general or something like this. I can't remember exactly the term, but it was something like a courageous general. So I'm saying, and even with Barack and even with the circumstances that existed, it was a kind of, I was kind of, I, I wasn't even able to understand, you know, except for within the very complicated, obviously, Israeli politics, why would he allow the Sharon visit to take place? Why was it when it comes the time for the second stage or third stage of redeployment from particular parts of the West Bank, he would kind of say, no, I won't be able to do it, let's discuss something else. So what I was saying is that, unfortunately, that makes me really sad, actually, that there's a lot of, a lot of time has been wasted for no reason, you know, except that Apparently, and you will never, I don't think I'll ever, like, kind of, the Arab world would see an Israeli leader who's 100% perfect, or, or the Israeli side should expect a, a, a Palestinian leader on the other side is going to be 100% perfect. But, and even when Sadat came, you know, to Jerusalem, he did not say, he went, he said in the middle of the Knesset that we still want uh, the two-state solution, 67, East Jerusalem being a Palestinian state. And Arafat did a lot of that. And I don't know, even, again, as a reporter, because I covered that between 93 and 96, uh, for the first time you could see things on the ground happening yourself when there was Oslo peace talks and joint projects started. People came to Sinai to build hotels. I remember Mr. Nabil Saad speaking about uh, Gaza exporting flowers to the world. And some of that actually took place. And there was a piece of optimism, you know. But then, unfortunately, you know, things would then, you know, keep on going down the drain. And sometimes, of course, because of Palestinian mistakes. But uh, on the other side, maybe, I, I don't know, probably I think you would agree with me out of reading what, what you've been writing, that also there hasn't been yet that kind of strong will on the Israeli side to do it, you know, to do it with the Palestinians. And there is, I think, I believe, this school of thought that okay, the, that's, the longer that's you really wait, what I wanted to respond to, better which is agreement the, the key point. More, I think, I so. think that... Um, that what you're dealing here with is a historical process. Uh, the mood, the, the public mood in Israel toward this process has changed extremely significantly over the period of time that you're talking about. Uh, the, the idea of mm -hmm. a two-state solution, which, for instance, back at the time that Sadat came, or in the early 80s, if you said in Israel that you were in favor of a two-state solution, you were putting yourself at the radical edge of Israeli politics. Today, that's a mainstream position. In the 2006 sure. elections... Of course. No, the, the, the public in the mood 2006 is definitely elections, in There's no question. Uh, as fragmented as the election results were, one thing that was completely clear was that the debate was no longer over whether to give up parts of the West Bank, which had always been the dividing line in Israeli politics, but how much to give up, which is a completely different level of, of debate. Um, mm -hmm. I think probably the most significant thing there, mm -hmm. even though uh, Ehud Olmert is very, very far from being my hero, but it, it's incredibly significant to see people like Olmert or Livni, who are second-generation uh, politicians of the Israeli right who grew up in a party that that uh, that stood for the idea of uh, the whole land of Israel of not retreating an inch from the Jordan River, suddenly coming to the recognition that uh, Israel would have to make a historic compromise with the Palestinians. I mean, if I got if I uh, opened up the newspaper tomorrow and saw that Dick Cheney had come out for socialism it would be less surprising to me than it was when Ehud Olmert came out for the idea of partition of uh, the historic land of Israel or historic Palestine, using whichever name you want. That was a, a, a major sure. shift, and I think it reflects a major shift in overall Israeli public opinion. Uh, there have un sure. undoubtedly... Sure, I agree with you. There is a major shift in Israeli public opinion, but also you know as well as I do that when it comes to the tough issues, including in the upcoming, you know, conference, I mean, and again, just judging by my own experience in covering previous negotiations, when it comes to the thorny issues, you know, Jerusalem, the refugees, the border issues, what, what shape this Palestinian state is going to look like, you know, this just collapses, you know, one way or the other, and then, like... Um, because, well, of course, each side will start blaming the other about Jerusalem, you know, whether the Arabs should, which part should they take, what responsibilities, the refugees' issues, all these kinds of stuff. But 
I mean, what makes me a little bit suspicious is not only the internal problems of Mr. Ormer, but, I mean, uh, all the other issues that we spoke about in terms of the existing regional circumstances, but also, again, you know, uh, maybe these, um, some, I'm sure you've r read these arguments as well, that after the Palestinian Intifada, maybe the mood in Israel shifted more towards uh, a more hardline policy towards Palestinians after all the, 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 you know, the bombings that took place in Israel and all these attacks, you know, that, that like m maybe what I've been reading is that maybe there's a, now a kind of a reverse kind of support for the issue of, you know, withdrawing from the Best Bank at uh, this stage because now people are saying, look at Gaza, we're getting rockets from Gaza, so what if we withdraw from the West Bank, we're going to get rockets from the West Bank. Although, I mean, of course, I, I, I have my own explanation why the situation has never improved in Gaza because you could pull out your troops, you know, from there on the ground. They, okay, they're not in the cities, but Gaza is like a prison. And I think, I mean, this is not my judgment as Khaled Daoud. This is the judgment of UN human rights groups, of, you know, international monitors in the ground that Gaza is a prison. And even before the Hamas takeover, you know, it wasn't easy. So th well, that's so why here you have a, a reading that Israel pulls out from Gaza, but, you know, they never really make the people in Gaza feel the benefits of peace. No airport, no roads, no borders, you know, no export to the same problems, the back-to-back -back trucks that come. And so I'm talking in probably, you mean, you've been there, or I'm, I'm sure you know as much as I do about the situation in West Bank and Gaza. It, it's, uh, the situation there is very, very bad and very dramatic. And as far as I know, I mean, the figures that I read, the numbers of employment, the, the availability of food and medicine, all these things does not create even the minimum amount of confidence among the people that the other side really wants peace. So th that's also way why, you know, I have some my own suspicions that, you know, a, a peace agreement might be near because I don't feel that, you know, there is this serious desire to push towards a final peace Well, I would say that, that you've I, I, would, I would sum this up a little bit differently. First of all, I think that the levels of mistrust are very high. The Gaza pullout taking place unilaterally without, a nego without being part of a negotiating process, uh, I think, empowered the most extreme forces on the Palestinian side. Uh, that's one of the, that's the second side of, of the Gaza situation, is that uh, not only Hamas, but the more militant wing of Hamas is, is now in charge in, in uh in Gaza, and that creates tremendous mistrust on the Israeli side. Uh, when I mentioned before that the question is, what does Abbas control, that's a very significant question for making any agreement, because even if, if Mr. Abbas is completely sincere about his desire to have a two-state solution with Israel, I think that one of the major questions on the Israeli side is, fine, he signs an agreement, we pull out, but does he control the territory, or does Hamas end up doing the same thing in the West Bank that it did in Gaza? And then we, uh, then we have Qassam rockets falling not just on uh, Sterot, but on Jerusalem and on Tel Aviv. I, that's not a theoretical issue for me. I live close enough to the, to the Green Line, to the West Bank, to say, uh, you know, I want to make sure that if we pull out of there, that there's somebody actually in charge who, who can enforce the peace, as it were. So that, that creates a, um, a lot of doubts. Uh, I'm certain that on the Palestinian side, there are great doubts about uh, a, how willing the Israelis are to move forward on this. Um, perhaps that puts the, mm -hmm. the uh, that focuses precisely why there is a need for a strong role from a, an outside power, which can really only be the United States in facilitating this. Um, yes, I, I would, yes, I would also say that, yes. that what it leads to is you need to look back at, at two historic examples. Uh, in, the, in the case of Egypt, and, and I, I would stress here that when the peace process, uh, the peace uh, treaty was signed with Egypt, it was only five years after uh, an extremely brutal war between Israel and Egypt, a war that began with an, Isra with an Egyptian a surprise attack on, on Israel. So if today it looks like that's not the key issue, uh, in Israel of 1977, Egypt certainly did look like a central issue. It's only a product of mm -hmm. the success of that peace, cold as it may be, that we can talk about Egypt being mm -hmm. peripheral today. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I, you see, like, that's where I have a problem, actually, you know, like comparing the situation of Egypt, Jordan, or Syria, you know, to the situation of Palestinians, I just find it difficult because these were already established states, you know what I mean? And uh, the, the, their conditions were very different. You know as much as I do about the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, the history even of the region itself, you know, how it developed, how the Palestinians ended up without their state of their own, and how the, all the partition plans, all the British did, you know, all, all these is kind of, of, of uh, you know, history issues that makes the conditions of the Palestinians difficult. And I just wanted to note something, like when you asked, is our best really in control? I mean, again, by being a reporter who follows this issue, it's uh, practically, speaking, being, I've been to the West Bank and guys were reported out of there, I've been to Israel, it's uh, proper. It's the issue is Israel is in control. It's not that best in control or Hamas in control or anybody's in control. In the West Bank, and in my opinion, to a very great extent until now in Gaza, Israel is in control. And I also think that you would agree with me that there is too much international desire for a peace agreement to be reached between Israel and Palestinians, particularly these days, you know, and maybe over the past few days, that if that deal is, if that peace deal is reached, there's going to be so much international guarantees for its success that it will not only be the issue of whether our best controls or our best not controls, but that the people will sense that they will have something so precious that they've managed to achieve that they want to keep, you know, and then maybe then the situation will change. But if it always ends up like, you know, the way it's being done before with the Oslo peace process, dividing the West Bank into three stages and then one stage and then area B, area C, area D, and like uh, this part uh, with this amount of control, this part, that's not the, like the real kind of, you know, what I would, we we'll all keep on talking about historic thing. If this, you know, the two-state solution with borders, everybody knows what's happening with Jerusalem, everybody knows, I mean, geez, when you have this kind of package that has the support of Israel, Palestine, but then all the major world powers, you know, the Americans, the Europeans, even the major Arab countries, I can feel almost sure, I mean, by even reporting on major Arab countries, that even Saudi Arabia, for example, if they feel that there is a serious offer, a real serious offer, like, you know, whereby there is full Israeli withdrawal without any of these little major, not like little, but major caveats here and there of uh, a Taibas road here or a settlement there, or I don't know what comes from here to there, dividing the West Bank three parts, you know. If you avoid all this and do what, like, the Clinton parameters or, you know, the exchange of lands and make this a real thing, people would feel like the Egypt-Israel peace deal in terms of this time of starting the real implementation and by a particular date there is this Palestinian state. I think at that time you will see a lot of things changing, you know, in the Arab world, particularly, I assume and I hope and I think, you know, in terms of the support for Hamas or for even Islamic groups in, in, the, in the Arab world. And that's what we can, Mr. Abbas, in my opinion. Mr. Abbas is, you know him in Israel more than anybody else. He's a very serious man about the peace process. And you remember very well when he was first elected in 2005 as president, even an election monitored by President Carter, and everybody, there was a lot of expectations at that time that support this guy, support this guy in the year that's coming before the 2000, so that Hamas won't win it, you know what I mean, but in the year between January 2005 until the end of, you know, uh, the end of that year, again, the same problems, Abbas got nothing, Abbas did not manage to release prisoners, he did not manage to remove any of the outposts, so that, that's the, what weakens Abbas in my opinion, and not only his ability to control, uh, you know, a few militants here or a few militants there, because as I said, if this big peace deal takes place, I think Israel will have lots of guarantees from so many influential parties that should make it safe that this thing should work. Well, you know, the, one, the, 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 the question that still occurs there is that the thing that Abbas was not able to do during that period, which was really critical, is, is something that he's talked about, which is essentially that the Palestinian Authority becomes the only... Uh, it, that it gains a monopoly on force within its own territory. I mean, let's face it, there is never, sure. and, sure. and this was a failing that went back to uh, Yasser Arafat as well. The, 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 the critical mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. in the creation of a polity is the moment at which the government becomes the monopoly on force. And uh, uh, during the Oslo process, yes. Arafat was uh, approached at at certain moments, but was never willing to carry out carry that out completely vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hamas, and certainly uh, after Mr. Abbas became president of the PA, we can put the whole Arafat period behind us, but he was also not willing to, to or perhaps not capable, of taking the steps toward uh, disarming Hamas, really turning Hamas from 
a, a separate independent armed force into simply a political party within a um, within a, at least a uh, an entity that was on its way towards statehood, and so uh, I mean I think that that's the the question that you're that you're seeing on the Israeli side that that's what creates the 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 sense of distrust on the on the Israeli side is okay he's serious mm. he wants to make but, a deal but, you know, I, but yeah. once he has that deal once he has that state is that state going to be you know it's all very well and good what uh, what um, what Saudi Arabia says, it's very well and good what, what other outside forces says, but on, at the bottom line, is, is, he going to, is, is it going to be him or is it going to be Hamas controlling, uh, uh, controlling that territory? I say that as somebody who has favored mm -hmm. a two-state solution since the time when it was, when it was I know considered... That very well. I, I, think, I mean, yeah, when sure, I, sure. at the time when I originally favored a two-state solution, you made yourself an outcast within Israel doing that. So... I would put this differently. Of course, I would say of that, course. That, I understand that, that very well. part of the issue is that you've got to deal with those final status. Uh, the, the, the critical flaw with Oslo was that it put all the final status mm -hmm. uh, issues off to the end. And people thought that that was going to create trust, yes. and instead what it did is it created distrust, it created a situation where both sides were really trying to move, the, you know, waiting until the other guy was looking, to, looking away and and moving their players up on the board, uh, trying to create facts. That it happened with the settlements. It also happened with PA, uh, uh, with with the Palestinian Authority moving into East Jerusalem. Everybody was trying to 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 establish their positions for the final status talks before they took place. So what you need here, it would seem to me, I'm sure, I'm sure, but like, you I think, I think by even reading what this, yeah, but, but I think you know, Gresham, by reading the stuff that you've Again, personally wrote, you seem to have a very, very deep understanding of the realities on the ground in Palestine, in the West Bank and Gaza. And I think that uh, if you, maybe if I might call you a, a kind of the, on the peace camp side, you know, you kind of maybe would understand that the Palestinians think of themselves as a resistance movement against occupation. And in all the history of, I think, resistance movements, so people, who, I'm not arguing for or against, you might tell me, oh, they're not resistant, they're terrorists, but that's a different story on their kind of narrative. You know, they cannot, I mean, and I don't think there is any of that kind of movements that would totally, you know, be kind of get rid of their weapons and sole authority until at least, you know, you have the, the solid feeling that there is actually a state that I'm, I remember again, you know, when there was this, the, 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 the war, in, uh, sorry, the, the, the independent, you know, in Israel's creation in 1948, uh, when was even, it was Mr. Ben-Gurion who was having a fight with, you know, other, after the declaration of the states with, of, with Mr. Shamir, with people like Mr. Begin and uh, that, that, that time, you know, because they wanted to bring Which in weapons exactly inside why Israel and he even had to bomb the, that the ship. But, but that's but that's what well, that was after that was after the declaration of the state. The state was there. The, the, the Israelis. I, I'm mentioning this example because then the Israelis have managed to done what they have wanted. There was a state. It was like a, a you know a president. Everything was clear. You know, so uh, relatively clear to a great extent. I mean, but that's not the situation in the Palestinian case. You know. And again, that was probably, would probably be an argument that you would hear from a lot of Palestinians in your side, that Israel kind of, or, you know, big part of Israelis maybe, they want everything to be so perfect, so guaranteed, 100%, in a way that's never happening in anything, you know, and then they will make the so peace. So what I'm suggesting you know, is like, that... And it's a kind of defies realities. Hamas, if they're going to change their mind, they're not going to change their mind over a matter of five years or three years, or if, if, if the Arab and the Israelis are going to accept each other and live in peace. This is a matter that will take a practiced, will take trust, you know, so we have to live each other within the two states, and again, I refer to you with all the international guarantees that's going to exist, I think that Israelis know, and you know personally, you know, that you can get a very reasonably, you know, deal with, again, you know, the exaggeration of the, um, the, the, the uh, I, I will fully understand and respect all the Israeli, you know, fears and the, the, the psychology in Israel and all the background in Israel whereby if a projectile is being fired from, has, uh, from, uh, from Gaza, it's being called a missile, you know, over the matter of, I don't know how many years, four or five years now since they started doing these missiles from Gaza, maybe... Um, as far as I know, maybe three or four Israelis have died as compared to definitely hundreds and hundreds of Palestinians during that same period. So, I mean, like, 
it's, it's a little bit of exaggeration whereby you would need everything to be absolutely perfect. And that's not going to happen on the ground until you feel that historic closure, at least what I was referring earlier to this period of 93, 96, when people felt a little bit of confidence, so you can take the confidence moves. At that time, personally, you know, in Egypt, it was also something not totally accepted to be a member of an Israeli-Egyptian peace group. But then many people, when they saw the thing moving forward, you started hearing of committees of Israeli artists and Egyptian artists meeting, or even Jordanian and Palestinian joining in. There was this kind of a little bit positive mood. But now this positive mood does not exist, and it's not going to exist by insisting on having every single Palestinian arm being hidden away or only controlled by... Because you know that's not the realities on the ground. And the Palestinians will tell you if Israel had not managed to control Gaza itself and gather all the weapons from all the militias for 40 years, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, expect the PA with all its limited capabilities to do the job. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, so I think this the issue is what, bigger, uh, this is deeper what I'm, uh, than these little details. I mean, not little, it's important details, but, I mean, but they could be worked on. That's what I wanted I, to I say. I think that... <laughs> that from the Israeli side, the issue of, uh, first of all, of, of whether there is a, uh, an authority there which is capable even over the course of a transition period of asserting itself and, and gaining that control is, is really a critical issue. Of course. The, what, I was saying, what I was saying about Oslo is the, if, if I were to redesign the process now, what I would suggest is you have to deal with all of the final status issues up front. You have examples of that, like the uh, the unofficial Geneva Initiative, that show that those issues can be dealt with. I wish they would you implement the Geneva it Initiative. It's a perfect document, you know. But the, the issue is again, we would agree. I think the willingness to implement that, you know, to set deadlines, say three months we're going to do this, and six months we're going to do that, and one year we're going to do that. And I think that even the realities on the ground support those kinds of solutions, which me and you support. You know, the, 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 one of your articles, the issue of Jerusalem, you know, what's Arab is Arab, what's Israeli is Israeli. Uh, I mean, personally, I would even, you know, suggest like some sort of an international, uh, you know, kind of monitoring, at least, of all these holy places to all religions to avoid tensions as a matter of interdisciplinary period. But there has to be that willingness to do that. And I'm afraid... In Israel's side, if you're going to continue, guys, talking about the missile from Gaza, that there is uh, ten militants here who are hiding in this place, and two militants there who are doing this, and uh, you know, it's not going to move. You know, it's not going to move if you keep on insisting on the control of the border, on the issue of that there is no airspace for the Palestinians, no maritime control, treating. You know, it's. Uh, I think there is like a need for. Uh, of course, there is a lot of change in Israel. People like you right now would not have had the same freedom to speak maybe even 15 years ago, I think, like, after the Madrid peace process started, all these kinds of topics became... Well, we had plenty discussion. of freedom to speak. We just didn't have anybody listening to us. Of course, of course, <laughs> I mean, of, course. Nobody, of course. Nobody nobody, was preventing us from saying that. It was just a... Uh, it, was, it, was a uh, it was a marginal opinion. Of course. Note that the Oslo Accord itself, which was this huge breakthrough in recognition of the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people and so forth, still said nothing about a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as I've said, a two-state solution um, is now the mainstream uh, normal political position in Israel. If you're against that, you've, you've now put yourself at, at the far right, super nationalist uh, age of Israeli politics. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that you're that you're overestimating here the the resistance to the idea of an agreement here. I think yeah. that you're underestimating how um, how much uh, damage to trust has taken place uh, over the course, particularly the Intifada. But it's both sides um, too. It's both direct, sides too. Uh, both sides. You know, the mistrust is on both sides. It's not only on the Israeli side because absolutely. also the Palestinians so the, the can say, is, "After you gave us peace, you occupied the entire West Bank. You did this, you did that." You know, I mean, like we have uh, each side has a long list of complaints. So the question here is, I think, and, and here, you know, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, cite a conversation I had with uh, Sari Nuseba, the uh, president of Al Quds University. Yes, yes. The question is how to break past that mistrust, is to stop saying, you know, we're, we're arguing over this little thing and we're arguing over that little thing. And what uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so any uh, misstatement is my responsibility, not uh, Professor Nuseba's, but basically my understanding of what he was saying is you can't, it, the, that right now each side is, is coming into these negotiations with the attitude that I can't show all my cards because I have to save some of my negotiating chips for further in the process. 
and that's the that's a, a bizarre um, a uh, you know a marketplace uh, view of negotiations that you you start off offering to pay less than you really intend to because you're going to come up to the real price later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But you agree with and me that the, the, the week came close. You know, that's what I was mentioning earlier, that despite all this, I mean, the cards, and regardless of what each part's cards have and whatever you were going to try to keep, I, again, I refer to you, I mean, and what, I mean, your article about Jerusalem, the letter open to Hillary Clinton, about what you spoke about, the, 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 the divided city, the divided realities, that was exactly my feeling when I went to Jerusalem, is that, you know, guys, why are we fighting so much? You know, if the Palestinians are already living in their own part of the town, the Israelis live in their own part of the town. I had an Israeli journalist from Israel Radio who I was invited to come to my hotel where I was staying in East Jerusalem. The guy was kind of, mm, he took some time to think about it, and then he told me that he's never came to that part of, you know, East Jerusalem, you know, uh, and because it's a... Where was he from, by the way? I'm sorry, sir? Was he from Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? No, no. I, where, where did I meet that journalist? In East Jerusalem. I was staying in East Jerusalem, you know. And no, no. What I'm asking is the Israeli journalist, was he from... Uh, was he from Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? He was from Jerusalem. He lived in West Jerusalem. But and, and I'm just mentioning this. Very be interesting. Okay. Because it confirmed... Because usually Jerusalemites are less uptight about, about going to East Jerusalem than Israelis from elsewhere sure, in the country. Sure. Maybe it was also but, the but, year at that time. I was speaking maybe about the year like 2000 or something. You know, I, mean, I was speaking about the post. Um, you know, like you were even mentioning again in your article about the issue of the taxis, the, the Palestinian taxi could go so far because then it will become an Israeli area. I personally, you know, I mean, made a terrible mistake in 2000 too, and I crossed into, you know, the West Jerusalem part, which is, I'm not that much of an expert, and I lost my way, I was looking for an ATM machine, and I ended up in, you know, obviously, uh, the West Jerusalem, you know, basically, and uh, I was immediately, of course, picked up by the patrol police there, and as a suspect, uh, you know, suicide bomber, you know, and I was so glad I didn't lose my life that day, you know, because uh, I kept on saying, mm. uh, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, I'm Egyptian, I'm Egyptian, so it's like... Uh, you know, but, but I'm just saying that things, what I wanted to refer about the cards and not cards, and that there are realities on the ground, like what happened in Gaza. It didn't make any sense that you would have 7,000, 8,000 settlers in the middle of 1.3 million people who are turning their life into hell and controlling 40% of the land. That was not even a long-term way of living. No, I mean, I've been to Gaza myself, and I saw that settlements, and one thing that came to my mind, why would you want to live there? You know, if you're like any regular international human being, regardless of your nationality, why do you want to send your kids in like armored buses, you know, and, and live in under constant... So then the, the Israeli response to that is... And the same thing applied to, to is... Hebron, the same thing applied to certain settlements in the West Bank, you know, I mean, like, why you guys, like, come on, you know, you have, it's not that... And the, the, the conflict between us has been kind of going on for a while, the, the parameters... I mean, like, I, I was reading an article after the withdrawal from Gaza in one Israeli newspaper, and I think in her arts or the author, her note, and the guy, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the writer, but it was basically saying that, you know, I mean, right now Israel has done its major push to get immigrants from the Soviet Union after the fall of the so former Soviet Union. You've got all these guys from there. That, you know, for, you, Israel has done its best to get as many immigrants that it can, except for the reserve in America. You know, here you have like six million and other Jews, and they obviously don't want to immigrate to Israel. So, you know, the parameters kind of has reached kind of its capacity. You know what I mean? And the, you don't want to, you can't, like, guys at 1.3 million, where are you going to have more Israelis? And then with the West well, Bank, that's exactly 2 million why people, 2 million the, people, why? You know, that's why exactly have, why the... You know, uh, so let's, the, let's do the, it, you know. I mean, no more cards. You know, Jerusalem... You know the cards, you know where things are. I, as a Muslim, I want to go to the Aqsa Mosque to pray without being so searched by an Israeli soldier. You know, if he can guarantee me this safe passage, whoever wants to go, wants to go, I'm going to be very happy. You know, and no more, you know, talk and uh, someone wants to destroy that mosque or so. You know, just let's seek what I would think is a secular solution that respects all religions and makes relatively everybody happy without, you know, kind of giving a supremacy for one religion over the other or for one group over the other. Let, it's so possible. So what it's do possible. you say to the, the, the covering this from the Arab side? I mean, I'm going to, to, to lay out for you what, and, and I have certain criticisms of this uh, account myself, but I'm, I'm putting it to you. The, the, the standard uh, Israeli response to what you're saying is, look, in 2000, uh, Ehud Barak went to Camp David. Mm. He offered to, to have a, and I, I, I want to describe this, this whole picture as it's, as it's standardly told it, in Israel. I read it a lot Listen. here, uh, Gresham, in the American press. So the standard he offered his so, best okay, deal. So Arafat it. rejected the best he, deal, you know. And, he uh, offered <laughs> for, uh, Palestinian control of, of Al-Aqsa. He, uh, he offered a Palestinian state. 
he offered a situation that would basically have meant um, taking down at tremendous social cost within Israel most of the settlements. Um, he offered a two-state solution, and uh, and uh, Mr. Arafat basically said, yes, that's not you know that this and version then, of history is not true. Come on, wait, 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 come on. You know that, that, that this the, version the, of history is not true. You know that he didn't read. Okay, and, let and me, again, let me you know, finish the, the... Okay, fine. But just because finish, this is becoming, let, let, you know, I mean, like, if, well, okay, fine. So, 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 so the, the next part of, of the story, as, as the Israeli public sees it, is that... Uh, is that the negotiations are still going on, and in uh, at the end of September 2000, we have the outbreak of the Second Intifada. For no reason, and not because Sharon went and visited Al-Aqsa. We, they went to an Intifada because okay, they so just loved so, Intifada. So, the, so e- even if you, if you attribute that to Sharon's visit, which I think is actually very significant, but the, 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 the public mood that you're dealing with in Israel is one that says, we were in the middle of negotiations. Barack was making this huge offer, and by the way, Mr. Barack has done his best to, uh, for his own political needs, to um, to strengthen the belief in this version in the Israeli public. And then the Intifada breaks out, and the next thing we know, bombs are going off in Israeli cities, and, and kids and baby carriages are being blown up. And so, clearly, uh, you know, this is the impression that was created. They they are not interested in a uh, they're not really interested in a two state solution. I'm not, you know, so you're I agreeing could, with I me. You're agreeing, whole, you're agreeing with me. What I said earlier that there is my feeling that there is no sense for a, a strong support for a two-state solution that I was saying earlier, you know, and that's what I was trying to tell. But I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. But I what I'm to saying to you is, what I'm saying to you is, what, what is it that, um, what are the cards that you see the, um, you know, in other words, I'm willing to 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 argue within the Israeli side that the Israeli government should put the cards on the table and saying, look, for a clean two-state solution, two states living side by side in peace, we are willing to make a solution that's basically based on the pre-67 lines. And if there's any adjustments in those lines, it's going to be on a one-for-one territorial basis. We're going to make an agreement on that side. So what are the cards that you see the, um, the Arab side is having to put on the table to convince Israelis that this uh, that this agreement would actually work, and that that they're going to get what what they're paying for, which is um, essentially an end to a conflict, an acceptance of Israel's existence, an acceptance of Israel's existence as a Jewish state. What what can a the Palestinian side and b the wider Arab world put on the table in order to um, to rebuild that trust? Because that's crucial. Mm-hmm. Okay, but just first, you know, I mean, because I've been here living in this country for over five years, and since the first year I came in here, this is the kind of now the kind of accepted, none kind of questionable argument for many years that some parts that your virgin or, and you know, that the Camp David, he made the best generous offer, out of all the general offer, like kind of really, really disregarding all the historic realities that existed at that time. That again, Barack was having his many own internal problems. That Arafat could not sign a deal with that president. That he's going out of office in two months, and there's no guarantee that the next president is going to do the same kind of respect, the same kind of agreement that it was done. I mean, like the, the offer on Jerusalem, I think is controversial. You've read some documents, some books by Bob Morley, for example, who was attending, you know, that kind of session of negotiations. So, so this kind of presenting this line of argument that uh, Barack went uh, made the most generous out of what rejected, I think personally is totally inaccurate. And it's been kind of repeated so much, you know, by so many people here in this administration, and I think in a harmful way that prevented us from even reviving the Middle East peace process. So I just want to state my opinion, and I think the opinion of lots of people in the Arab world and the, on that kind of, you know, episode facto, this kind of thing that you want us to take it for granted that, you know, everything was milk and honey in Camp David and it was all out of us responsibility for destroying it. But at the same time, I want to move to the other point, Gresham, which you've raised, you know, which I think also... I, by the way, think that, for instance, Mr. Barack, it always impressed me as, as uh, an incredibly poor negotiator from the day that he became the head of the Labor Party. I'm not... Uh, I, I, I see what happened at Camp David as, uh, as much more complex than that. However... I'm saying that that is the That's uh, the vision. I know the that this is the stereotype. I know that this the, is like... That's the psychological reality I understand. that's being I understand. dealt with. And then... But it's your responsibility as a guy who supports peace. It's your responsibility as an Israeli supporter of peace. 
as much as it is my responsibility as an Arab who supports peace so, okay. to tell so our I people what what to I'm tell our people that okay guys maybe the story wasn't that much as you think it was and let's not believe in this and even if it was like that okay fine the Agayas died you've isolated him inside the Muqata'a for three years he did not deserve this kind of treatment in my opinion you know but at the end of the day okay fine whatever you know it didn't work so, what if, we, you know what, so, so now let's talk to the how cards how do we move past cards. that story that, that's the question is how do we move what are the what are the cards yes you're, you're gonna, looking at this sure. as a as a as a um, as an Arab journalist who is both inside of of the of the Arab reality and able to be critical of it what would you if if we turn the tables now and and, uh, and Mr. Abbas or for that Mr. Mr. Mubarak said all right Khalid uh, what do you suggest I do now to Well, um, I don't think they would ask me. That, that would be something really big, you know. <laughs> but, uh, well, <laughs> okay. like you know. But but, I, but, <laughs> but you're you're you're. Uh, I'm asking you. Okay, so you're going on. If, if if Al Jazeera has has promoted you to the to the role of its of its uh, of its commentator on political affairs, so you're you're. Um, you're I'm going not, to I'm advise not. either. Well, I wouldn't do that. Okay, no, I'm, you're, you're, I'm a reporter, and I'm speaking like kind of, I'm, you know, beside our main jobs. But we also. So you're in the position now that you can that you can offer that advice. I'm 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 uh, I'm granting you that position. What what would you advise to do to create yes. the sure, uh, sure. the Sadat momentum? Well, like, because I as I said, want, when Sadat came to I, Jerusalem, would, he was coming I, right after a war, basically. Yes, yes, yes. I understand totally what you're saying, and we've been through that a lot. But uh, first of all, I wouldn't elevate myself, you know, to that level of offering major advices and such historic difficult issues. But I just want to come back, Gresham, to one major point, in my opinion. This point that you're saying, the cards that the Palestinians have to present to the Israelis to make them 100% sure. I think that's the wrong question to ask, in my opinion, as an Arab, if you want to reach a historic solution for this problem. Because Palestinians feel and many Arabs feel that they are being a subject of great injustice and a, 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 an illegal occupation of their territory. So the issue is that they feel maybe sometimes that we really don't have much to offer, you know, because these are the people who are falling under occupation. So you're coming to the victim and ask him to give you guarantees from, you know, although you, the Israeli side now is the occupying side, to give them all guarantees that they're going to be nice to them as much as they want, the other side, in case the occupation ends. So ending the occupation of Palestinian territories is a moral obligation, in my opinion. It's something that goes according to international law. I mean, because th that's how things should be. You cannot occupy people against their own will, and the people as human beings, regardless of where we come from, our religion, the color of our skin, we're entitled to something called self-determination. That's how I personally, Khaled, that would look at this issue. But there are three million people now, at least, Palestinians, let alone the Palestinian refugees, who have been kicked out of their land in 1948, who are saying, we don't want to be ruled by another country called Israel or by another population who claim that they have more right than we do to exist in that place. So that's why I'm mentioning this point because if we get this point, maybe a few guys in Israel get this point, you know, maybe you will start to have a little bit of a different attitude. And I think you personally, Krishnam, as a kind of, again, person who belongs to the peace camp, you know about all the revisionist history that's been done in Israel, about the rewriting of history, of, particularly in terms of the treatment of Palestinians in 1948, about the issue of settlements, a book like yours, you know, about the settlements issue. I mean, the, the, the Palestinians, from my perspective, and I think very much from their perspectives, have rights. They are entitled to those rights, basic rights, you know, right to live like human beings, the right to be belonging to a state that they want of their own, you know, the right to a passport, the right to an airport, the, the basic rights that many people in the world enjoy, regardless of whether or not, what are the cards, what are the guarantees. I hope I'm making myself clear that the Palestinians feel there is an injustice imposed on them, like any other population, like my country, when it was occupied by the British, we were, we were occupied by the British. We're not supposed to give them guarantees that, you know, just pull out. They pull out. They have to pull out because it's illegal for them to be there, you know, in one way or the other, according to well, international so law. So that's like, you have to, you guys in Israel have to work on that too, you know, that you have to recognize that these guys, Palestinians, so I, have I, suffered there's, historic there's injustice, and you have to end here. it because it's immoral to occupy another population. And then we can talk about the guarantees, about the guarantees that are going to be not only Palestinian guarantees, but as I told you, Palestinian guarantees... Arab guarantees, international guarantees. And I think that should be more than enough, you know, to make people kind of, you know, uh, both sides safe that there is already a lot of support for this solution, if, if I might say so.
I, I think that, that uh, what I would sum up here, first of all, is that one of the uh, revisionist historians, new historians in Israel, Benny Morris, yes. wrote a book I have a lot about a hundred years of the con- a hundred years of the of the conflict, and and the name of that book was Righteous Victims, and the um, the reason I, I think that the title of the book was the most powerful part of the book because it left this beautiful ambiguity: who is the the victims here? Mm-hmm. And I think that part of the conflict is that each side has clung desperately to the uh, supposed righteousness of, of victimhood and uh, not stepped beyond that. And, and perhaps, you know, one of the, the critical aspects of, of, of reaching an agreement is the kind of uh, reconciliation process that goes beyond the formal agreement. Because to get somewhere, we have to go beyond the role of each reciting our our list of victimhood, our, our list of, of how we've been injured. And then sure, the second sure. question... I mean, the Arab side has to do a lot of understanding of Israel history and existence, but also, I mean, we have to do a lot. I mean, like, and maybe we don't have enough time to discuss that now, you know, this issue that we wanted to discuss about Israel being a Jewish state or accepting it de facto. So let's, let's but I'm just saying, up, you know, let's, in the Arab world, if we want a long-term historic peace agreement... We have to accept the Israeli side, but also the Israeli side has to accept that the Palestinian side. So here's has the some, card on the know, table that, that you that, that have to that, be guaranteed. That exists here, and I think that this is really the the critical side. In other words, I've said, and and I think that this is that this has been a historical development on the Israeli side, which is that there's been an acceptance of the idea of a two-state solution, which at some level or another means. Uh, a, a slow, painful recognition of the idea of self-determination on the Palestinian side. I don't think that's gone far enough in the Israeli public. I would be happier if, if my political camp had a lot more influence here, but I, I can see that change over time. And so the, the critical question sure. here is whether or not, I, I think that psychologically on the Israeli side, the critical question is whether or not there is acceptance of the idea of Jewish self-determination um, in part of this contested piece of land from the Palestinian side. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, and that's, that's what I would say is the card that, 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 um, that people are waiting to see whether it's, cl- it's clearly put on the table. Israel, you know, I mean, my attitude towards this as an Arab, and if I might just conclude by saying that, you know, and that was really kind of a change in my personal opinion when I first went to Israel in 19... I think 92, was that, you know, I recognized that, you know, I, I mean, well, we, I did have a lot of stereotypes before. I only thought I would go there to see Israeli soldiers killing Palestinians all the time back in 92. But then I went and I found a country, and I found a country that it exists, people, buildings, you know, beaches, everything. And I just said, you know, like, let's get, in my opinion, you know, you don't want me, you said you defined yourself in your emails to me that as a Zionist. You know, I cannot, as an Arab, I cannot be a Zionist. You know, you can determine the Jewish state as you want to do it. You can speak about the struggle of self-determination for the Jewish people over their historic plight and the history of anti-Semitism, which, of course, you would agree with me, existed in Europe. It was not in the Arab world that Auschwitz or the other brutal, you know, events that took place against the, the, the Jews at that time. But that, that's, you can do it your own way. I will, as an Arab, the maximum I could go for is to accept that and for new and new and new generations millions of people who came up Israel for us exist as a reality your own rhetoric about how you came up how you developed why are you there you know all this kind of stuff you know that's your business but don't accept me to or don't force me to agree on your version of history the maximum I could go for is that you guys have your own version of history this is your reality now that exists on the ground but don't go too far in denying the other side, the Palestinian side, they're right. And let's try that alternative piece. We've tried war for over 50 years. Let's try the two little state solution over what remains, and let's take it from there. But don't force me to accept your rhetoric, and don't, you don't have to to accept my rhetoric of how I see things. But we want to a pragmatic, realistic solution that will stop war, that will allow me as an Arab to work on my own countries, you know, in, in terms of education, in terms of health, and you can kind of prosper and see how you want your future to be. But that's, that's I think, where we have to stand, you know, and, and maybe, again, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the cameraman saying our time is up, but... You know, so I, let's, I just let's want to make this point the, clear. The, the, don't, the, don't push me to be an Arab Zionist because it's very difficult to have an Arab Zionist. No, no, <laughs> but know, I think Muslim that what Zionist you just said now is you know. the, an agreement for a pragmatic peace does not necessarily mean either side accepting uh, the narrative of history or the rhetoric of the other. And I would just, you know, sum up here to say that um, I think that 
there has been, we're, we're talking now, even just since the establishment of the State of Israel, we're coming up on 60 years of, of conflict. Um, and so, you know, maybe once people are sufficient, have sufficiently exhausted every other alternative, they'll try the alternative of peace. Maybe we finally reach the point where both sides are so, so exhausted Allah. from trying everything else that they'll finally uh, agree to live side by side with each other. Khaled, it's, um, it's Allah, been Allah. challenging and enjoyable speaking with you, and thanks very much. Same here. Shalom. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Bye-bye.